Are you ready? Let's go. Ready. Ready. Yeah, ready when you are. Okay, you ready? Yeah. Okay, you ready? I'm ready. Holden Shepherd, Heidi Anderson, Jan Latta, Alison Patterson, welcome to my little show. Why do you call it a little chat show? Jan Nichols, Sam Iken, Annabelle Smith, Donna Mazza, Rebecca Watson, John L. Fraser, Tracy Jacobson, Adam Wallace, Monique Mulligan, Matt Glover, Karen Young. I don't even know where I'm going with this. Welcome to my show. Before we meet our guest on Josh Langley Gets to Know, just a quick word about Here I Am, my online self-esteem course for kids. It is now up and running and it's actually going great guns. Getting some great feedback from parents, from kids, and um, industry professionals as well, like speech pathologists and OTs and stuff like that. So I'm really excited. Just go to my website, joshlangley.com.au to find out more and go to all the links. Also, click like, subscribe to the YouTube channel just so you get the updates when they come through when a new video is being released. And it also makes my stats look good. Okay, without further ado, now you're about to meet the amazing Josephine Taylor. Now Josephine has released her debut novel, Eye of a Rook, through Fremantle Press. And Josephine has a PhD in writing. She's an associate editor of Westerly Magazine and an adjunct senior lecturer in writing at Edith Cowan University. Now, Josephine is, a, is an important part of the WA writing community. I wanted to get her on to talk about this book, but more importantly, talk about the story behind this book. And during the interview and also during the research I did prior to this interview, I just found out some amazing information, that, stuff I never even knew about a chronic condition that, that, that Joe has and that millions of other women in Australia have and that you may not even have heard of. So... Let's find out what inspired this book and get to know Josephine Taylor a little bit better. Josephine Taylor, thank you so much for coming on my show. How are you going? I'm doing really well, thanks, Josh, and I'm really thrilled to have been invited to come on your show. Thanks well, for asking me. I'm, I'm excited because this is um, going to be like a, a slightly different kind of chat we're going to have i mean i've got your book here that i talked about in the intro i have a rook and i want to there's so many things i want to talk to you about this book about the title of it all that sort of stuff but i want to really sort of i mean i love the story arcs of the people behind the book what their stories are where they've come from to write it what the inspiration is and you've got a really unique sort of story and i think that's relevant for a lot of women around the world um and with most of my audience women so i think it's going to be relevant for them and but also i think it's going to be interesting for men to get their head around what we're going to talk about in a second because i think the the idea of empathy and getting people to understand what other people are going through especially men to understand what women go through especially when it's a condition that i have a, i have spent the last few days trying to get the pronunciation right josephine it's <laughs> vulvodynia and I'm going to say the other word that goes with that. I'm going to the first time to say it on my show ever, vagina. <laughs> well done. I'm going to well say done. I'm not going to be afraid. <laughs> Josephine, can you please explain a little bit about what vulvodynia is? Sure. Uh, so vulvodynia is chronic unexplained vulva pain. So in the vulva, which is the um, external genitalia of the women, of a woman. Mm -hmm. um, it's chronic in that it lasts three months or longer and that you can't really easily find an explanation for it. Um, the symptoms can range quite radically. So you can have a situation where you might just have pain or discomfort with pressure to the area. So for instance, with tampon insertion or intercourse, right through to spontaneous widespread um, even constant pain sort of over over the genitals, perhaps down the inner thighs, the buttocks and so on. So, um, yeah, there's a lot of variety there. You can have both as well. There is also quite a lot of different causes. Mm. So these can range from um, chronic uh, candida infection, for instance, uh, urinary tract infections, repeated urinary tract infections, uh, dermatological skin condition, uh, post-surgery, surgery, for instance, to repair that area after childbirth, uh, impact injury, 
Um, and then also you can have um, primary, primary mm. vulvodynia or secondary. So primary is when a woman has always had that pain as long as she can remember, but perhaps particularly noticed it when she became a teenager and she started actually menstruating and, and mm. so on and becoming sexually active. Or it can be secondary, which is, is in, in my case, secondary. So a woman can be completely um, normal. Uh, in terms of her that area and um, because it affects sexuality, her sexual um, life. Uh, but, yeah, so that's, that's the kind of range. Mm. Um, the prevalence is around between 10 to 28% of all women. That's a lot. That's experience. a really high percentage. It's a lot. And how come, it's a lot. How come it's, I have yeah. never heard of it? I mean, do a lot no. of women know of it or not? Yeah. So really, I think like when I first got this, like nobody knew about it unless you had it. And even if you had it, you didn't know what to call it. What I find now is if you've got it, you know about it. Or if you've met somebody, if you haven't, you don't. The reason for that is because nobody talks about it. Mm. And the reason for that is because we have this really long history of um, shame and um, I guess, where women's disorder hasn't been investigated sympathetically or um, accurately mm. or by listening to the woman herself. Uh, so that's probably why. You, but, yes, exactly. So if you're looking at, I guess, 16% um, even, which is a number that's thrown out, you're looking at over 2 million Australian women, if I've got my maths right, because I'm really, really it's poor at maths. But either, if my maths though. is right. <laughs> No, but we're looking at millions anyway. Yeah. And also the highest, um, the, the incidence onset is highest between 18 to 25. So we're looking at a real, a lot of young women as well, which is really um, upsetting and, and yeah. difficult when you think about that this is a time when a woman is actually starting to express her sexuality and wanting to form a long time a long-term relationship potentially might not necessarily be, but, but mm. maybe. I, I was, I was going to say with, with that age group, are they more likely to openly discuss things like that? Uh, so I, I think that, that any age group is inclined. It really just depends on the person. Mm. Uh, I suspect that when you're young and when there's a lot of peer pressure, you're possibly less inclined to, but I don't know this for a fact. I think, you know, there's so much pressure now, which is sort of fed by pornography and by societal kind of ideas of what sex should be and what, what women, how women should be mm. sexually. But I think that, you know, and as we know, teenage, as a teenage year and young person, you're particularly susceptible to, to peer pressure. So um, I would imagine, but I don't know for sure, that unless you have friends that you feel that you can be, you know, really open and honest with, it's something that you might hide, particularly if you can get away with it. So if it's, for instance, just pain at the time of intercourse, you might decide, okay, I'm just going to put up with this, particularly if the pain's not debilitating, and um, just get through it. And I still get the, the kind of, you know, the closeness. I still get the tick of kind of being act sexually active and so on. I don't know. I can't speak for young women, but I think that um, that may we, you know, that there may be some pressures about not disclosing. But I speak to women of all ages, and um, I, I want, at one point I spoke to the carer of a woman in her nineties, um, you know, so in all ages, and mm. and this woman had never spoken, I, I don't think, to anyone. So no, it's to, a really, yeah, to live with that for. Because there's no cure, is there? There's, there's only sort of treatments that may be able to sort of alleviate the suffering for a little bit or? I think this is part of the problem. Because there has been so much shame and silence around it, um, research has really lagged. And because it's, because it's a chronic pain condition, and we've only really res recently recognised chronic pain as a, as a disorder in its own right. Mm -hmm. So research has lagged for a couple of reasons. So this means that, <clears throat> excuse me, you don't necessarily get the right kind of treatment initially. And you also, which is what happened to me, is you might get the, the wrong kind of treatment. And what happens is that that can then embed the condition. There, 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 is, there, there are women who recover from it completely. 
So yeah. that I will be really clear about that. It's not that there, there is cures, but unfortunately there's no one cure for everyone. Yeah. Yeah. So different women, like for instance, if you're a young person and you go along, you're saying, okay, I have to, dis- discomfort with intercourse the um person you see the gynecologist or specialist says okay well perhaps you need to use more lubrication you need to have more foreplay etc and they find that gradually that kind of settles it down Uh, you know Mm. so that's Mm. just one example or somebody finds that there's a chronic skin condition underlying it and when they treat that things improve but mm. it's certainly true that I think um, it can be something that you do learn to manage uh, for a lot of women. I, I have contact with a lot of women uh, in Facebook groups, many, many, many women. Yeah. And, um, yeah, and they, you know, a lot of them live with it. So um, I don't want to be too negative mm. about those because it is possible to recover. And I think the more that we talk about it, the more that we get research and money devoted to it the more likely it is we get the right kind of conservative treatments early on to help and then it won't necessarily become a chronic problem i think i think i think you're right there and i think even just like having having you on here talking about it is one of those small steps because the psychological effects because i was doing a little bit of research can be really debilitating they you you end up literally just shutting down from like if it's a that chronic pain condition there are so many triggers that it basically creates a trauma and then you just shut down from the world. You don't want to go out any, even just the the touch, the loving touch of your husband can send off these fear signals and then everything just shuts down. How do, how do, how do you cope with that? That's so good, Josh. Is it trauma's the right word? I Mm. think, uh, again, I think there's different levels depending on how bad it is, but yes, I think that um, that is certainly how I, at one point, I, um, when I was researching this for my PhD, um, I kind of tried to, I was looking at how trauma might cause vulvodynia. I was exploring trauma and seeing if maybe trauma underlay, mm. underlied this for um, women. But it seemed to me in all my research that what was happening more was that the condition causes trauma, as you say, yeah. and that that then just feeds into a downward kind of spiral. So, um, and I know that for myself, I withdrew for years. I became a a recluse for years and it is difficult. It's like any kind of chronic pain condition, as you say, you know, you can shut off from the world. If everything you do causes pain, Mm. you just avoid all of the different things that cause pain. So going to the toilet or being touched. Mm. I mean, when it's really bad for me, it's like, you know, touch is, is, you're just so sensitized your whole Mm. body. Um, even the wind against my back or so it's um, you can understand why women who have it at that level do just kind of try to turn away from the world unfortunately then you get yourself in that terrible sort of dark space mentally so Mm. that's not really a solution Um, it's really but you know for me I certainly seemed to need to go through through that before I sort of came out the other end. I was going to say, I what, don't was think the, what was the trick? What was the trigger for you to to whether it was a conscious choice or not to go? I am not going to let this chronic condition define me. What was what was mm. that? What was that moment? If you if you can isolate it, mm. you know, I think I, I think I. St- Oh, goodness, that's such an interesting question. Um, I think that really when I began writing, so that would have been 2003, 2004, and that was when I sort of really started to feel like, okay, I've got to do something here. I'm not Mm. getting better. I would tried doing absolutely nothing. I tried all sorts of treatments. I tried doing absolutely nothing for years. I tried treating myself health-wise and so on, Um, organic foods, juice, you know, everything. Um, So then I thought, okay, I've got to do something. So that's when I started researching and writing. And I think when you write about something, you are redefining it. You're defining it on your own terms. It took a lot. That was a long, slow process, though. And I think, too, until around about 2010 or 2011, I was still in battle. So I was still fighting Mm. the illness. And... That's okay, but if you're going to have to learn, like it took me a long time to accept that I was not going to go back to who I was before 
So I think for about 10 years, really what I was wanting was for this to go away yeah. and for me to go back to how I was. And I got to the point where I was, it's not. Or even if it does, it's not going to by you doing this. You have to engage with it. You have to maybe listen to it. You have to be responsive to it. You have to see what it's trying to tell you. Not necessarily because I'm like, you know, um, or my shoulders are hurting because I'm carrying the weight of too many people. I don't think yeah, it's yeah. Ne necessarily that simple, mm. but I do think that fighting it wasn't getting me um, to where I needed to go. So, yeah, yeah. I think that's I, th that I, 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 I hear that as a common theme for a, a lot of chronic illness and stuff like that is mm. this, this, this denial, this fighting, this battle, this, this, this me against whatever that illness is or the, whatever that chronic condition is. But it's like when you suddenly lay down the armory and go, okay, let's just take a proper look at this. It doesn't, it's not as so consuming. It's still there, but it allows a different relationship to form in that sort of situation. I think so. I think that in the writing, when it, because I was writing about it, and then when I started writing fiction, which was in 2013, I was working creatively with the material. And there's something about doing that that really changes pain and the way pain is perceived. I don't really know how it works, but it does. So okay. that was that was really interesting. But the other is thing that, is, is that, too, I'm, I'm, that, I'm going to interrupt. Is yeah. that because you're getting it yeah. out of your head? Uh, look, I, I don't know. I, yeah, I think part of it is that you're distracted. And I think mm. the pain has to be at a point where you can be distracted. So, for instance, I couldn't do it if I was sitting down. So I work yeah. standing. Mm. So I think it's partly you're being distracted. Your body is, and your brain is being distracted. But there is, I think that it's, there's something else going on which I don't understand. I have read um, different people talking about sort of analgesic effects or of creativity mm. or uh, so, you know, I, I think that there may be things that are going on in the brain that are to do with perhaps rewiring around the pain, but I'm not sure how that works. Yeah, and, yeah. I, and I also, when I did write the most difficult parts of I Have a Rook, it sort of really it took me back to that. So that kind of rewoke the pain. So that, that kind of worked against it. But, yeah, I, I don't understand it, Josh, but it's something that happens it really does um and i really trust creativity and the unconscious so mm. i just I, I look so do i i mean because okay. you're a trained psychotherapist because you 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 yeah look did that help did that yeah. help you at all um look i'm and, and you know that i probably wouldn't be anymore i'd have to update my qualifications given that it's 21 years ago but yeah look mm. i i actually just graduated at the time when i mm. developed the Volvodynia. Uh, I've been in practice for a couple of years, but I'd spent over 20 years being involved in psychology in that I was in Jungian analysis mm. for many years with three different analysts in Perth and Melbourne. So I had a really, really, I was really steeped in psychology and psychological understanding, particularly through literature, what you learn through about human nature through literature. Yep. Um, I think that I don't think it hurt because it was really, really clear to me from the very beginning that this wasn't psychological because mm. the pain was at such a level, at such a frequency, it was impossible for it for me to sort of say, well, this is just in my head. Nevertheless, I did do all the things that a good therapist should do. I sort of explored my past and I looked at the dreams that came up and I kind of did all that. I've done that millions of times, but I did it again. And yeah. um and, but there was really nothing there that would mm. explain this. So then I started to think, okay, well, rather than thinking about it as what is this, what is it about me that's made me get this, you know, what's wrong in my past or whatever that's made me get this, maybe I should think about the future. What is this taking me towards? So that was a long, slow process as well. Mm. But what happened was when I started presenting on vulvodynia and when I started um, um, reading out my, my work from my novel and so on, each time I did that I had such a positive affirming response that my confidence grew a little more 
And the other thing was that all the things that I couldn't do, there were a lot of things I couldn't do, but mm. each time a door opened, I'd go through it. So really, without Volvodinia, I wouldn't have done the PhD in writing. I wouldn't have written my thesis. I wouldn't have written a novel on this. I wouldn't be have been teaching creative writing at uni. I wouldn't be associate editor at Westerly. So my whole life now, my career anyway, is because of Volvodinia. And that, I, I find that staggering but also not surprising if that makes any sense because it's the mm. it's the most strangest things that can trigger this chain reaction of events so with because you've actually got um uh, with your phd with your thesis which was a, a memoir that you wrote about volvodinia so and that was qu quite a sort of a tome of a of a book wasn't it yeah, it was 100,000 words. You usually do your exegesis and your creative things separately. But I got part of the way through and they were intertwined and, I, and, and somebody at uni said, well, I don't see why you can't do it as one thing. Oh. So I did. So it was like an investigative memoir. It was like yeah. a kind of research into the history of vulvar pain and hysteria. Mm. It was mm. a research into neurophysiology and um, women's studies and, um, you know, all sorts of areas yeah. to try and make yeah. sense of this. Yeah, yeah. Now, is that your phone that's ringing? Because I'm. <laughs> that was my grandfather clock. Oh, was it? Chiming. It was oh, chiming. That is, yeah. That is the cool. Because I thought, you know, because now, because now phones have got all the different types of bells and whistles <laughs> and all that. Oh, that is a very good. But <laughs> grandfather clock, you got yeah, me there. It was an actual grandfather clock. Yeah. <laughs> so, but, <laughs> but the pH, but but doing all that research, writing it, mm. changing the relationship with it. Obviously, then, then that that sparked off because you wrote a short story after that, didn't? you? Because what, what what was the shift to go from writing it as memoir to writing it as fiction? What was that, and why? Okay. How did that change you? Well, how did that happen? Yeah, mm. and what? Yeah, how did it change me? Absolutely. Look, I finished the the memoir, and then I just sort of thought, oh, I'll, I'll get published. And um, I didn't oh, I'll just get published. And I tend to lose confidence easily. I, I did send it off to about four different places, I think, and mm. I got no's. I had one publisher that probably my favourite publisher said that we've all read it and we all love it, but we don't usually publish debut memoir um, and suggested I take it to a particular publisher, mm. which I didn't end up doing, but um, for, for, for particular reasons. But... I guess so. I guess I came up against those walls and um, I do lose confidence easily. So I tend to go away from things and then reboot and go back to them. Um, but in this case, you know, it happened about four times and I sort of thought, uh, I was really busy with teaching at ECU at that time at Edith Cowan University in yep. creative writing. And um, what happened was that I, I think I was trying to still get it out. Um, I sent a piece of writing, a personal essay to Susan Medalia, the Perth writer Susan Medalia, mm. to have her assess it. And really, in many ways, that was me just kind of trying to form a relationship with her because I thought she was so cool. Um, we all do the she, same thing. Yep. We do. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, no, please, uh, you know, you're a fangirl kind of, you know. So, um she, she gave, she was amazingly generous and gave a, very, a, a written assessment. Um, and basically one of the things she said was that another alternative would be to recast this into fiction. You have the ability to do that or something along those lines. Mm. And I thought, oh, okay. Um, and then I went away again. And then um, I was in the Advanced Writers Group at Peter Cowan Writers Centre in 2013, mm. and I was in a writing workshop and Fionn Murphy, the writer Fionn Murphy, an ECU lecturer, mm. um, narratage, she gave a writing prompt and before I knew it, I'm writing this story which was about a painting of a boat on the wall and there's two men in this room. One of them is the surgeon Isaac Baker Brown and the yep. other is this guy who's consulting with him about his wife who has vulvodynia. Completely spontaneous, complete, no planning at wow. all. I mean, yeah. I've, I've, read, I've read that chapter because that's in the book. <laughs> yeah, so that 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 um, story that which became yeah. that hand, yes, became the first chapter. It's quite different now, but yes, that yeah. became the the first and it just, it just, chapter. It just it, it, it bubbled up, if you want to use that yep, term. Yeah, it idea bubbled up. Wow. 
Exactly. It just it came from nowhere. I mean, it came from somewhere in that there was had been so much research underlying it. Mm, so mm. I knew I'd been researching Isaac Baker Brown, the, the Victorian surgeon, for a long time. I'd been researching a dedication he'd written in a book and trying to work out who it was made out to. Mm. I'd been researching the history, you know, the, the history of Victorian, um, the gynaecologists in Victorian England. So there was a lot of research. I'm just, just going to interrupt you there because when people read the book, they'll, they'll might sort of, when they uh, read about the, um, the Victorian England gynaecology, like, <gasps> I was... Yeah, not not a pretty thing. Yeah. Not a pretty thing. Really, it's really not a terrible. pretty thing. Mm, it is really a really terrible, terrible thing. And I, I, you know, and so I had some hesitations about that too. But I think mm. also that because my the memoir hadn't at that point been accepted by anyone, I also had this sense of urgency and pressure still that um, hadn't been hadn't gone because I still had this real need to get this out into the world so mm. I think the combination of the research and that urgency just brought came out and then yeah then it just went from there I decided okay I'll, I'll see where this takes me and I asked Susan if she'd be my mentor and she said yes um, and we worked together till 2018 um, mm. in bits and pieces but yeah Isaac Baker Brown is a really um Really, really troubling figure. He was. Um, shall I? Did you want me to talk about what he did? Or yeah, I'll, no? <laughs> it, it, uh, no, actually, no. I, 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 only because no. I find it really. I find it confronting, especially yeah. the attitudes in those days, and what yeah. they actually did, and how they thought this was going to be the cure all. I'm going, really? Even someone with yeah. All, any, anyway, so I want to know. Yeah. So, how long did it yeah. take you to actually write Over Rook? Yeah, so I began at the beginning of 2013 and I finished it in August 20, sorry, 2013, yes, and or finished it in August 2018. Mm. So over five years, but I was also uh, for the first few years, till 2016, w working, uh, teaching quite a lot at ECU. So I'd really um, just do the writing in the breaks mm. mainly. Yep. Mm. And then um, I was at Westerly from August 2017 um, so again, I just I was getting towards the end then. So fortunately, I, I could do that. So yeah, over five years, Josh. How did you go with? You knew you knew you had to go back to places that were going to that weren't going to be nice to go to. Did you prepare yourself for the re-traumatization? If you know, if you know what I mean, like like brace yourself. I've got to rewrite this. How did you go about that? Yeah, I don't think I did. It might have been a good thing to do that, but I don't think I did. I don't think you know. You know, you know, as a writer, how mm. you get into a zone, and you, you're not necessarily knowing exactly what's coming next as well. Mm -hmm. um, so, I, I wouldn't necessarily know that this was coming next. But I, I had written a lot on Volvadinia, and I, I had, I was still publishing. So I've had about five or six personal essays published now. Mm. on Volvadinia. <clears throat> uh, so I was probably used to it or aware of it. Um, I think that it's, yes, it might be re-traumatising in some ways, but it also gives that sense of, um, I don't know if catharsis is the right word, but that mm. you're doing something meaningful yeah. with yep. that. Yep. Yep. If I was just feeling the pain again, it'd be like, oh, this is horrendous, but mm. I'm doing something meaningful with it. And I think it's what um, oh, it's the the old adage. I think Holden Shepherd said at one of his talks that really stuck with me, which was, "Right from your wounds, no, right from your scars, not from your wounds." And yeah, which I, he, I, yeah, I didn't actually believe him when he when he said it, and I <laughs> dove headlong into my own memoir. Right now, nah, I'm gonna I'm gonna I'm gonna write from my scars. And look, I remember and I look, that. And I looked back at it, and it was like. This is horrible. I just sound like a windy yeah. old nana. Like, okay, <laughs> see what I mean? Let's put the manuscript away for a bit and then come back. And so mm -hmm. I, I now have a, a deeper sense of that. And that's the same thing that you're you're sort of almost saying is like you're writing now for the purpose of it, giving it meaning and it's, and it's having a, a benefit in the world at the time. I think so. I guess um, <clears throat> I think um, I think Sisonki, um, Holden says Sisonki said that first, but I've heard it yes. from different people. So yeah. it's this apocryphal kind of right from right from the scars, not the wounds. Uh, and I think everyone works that out differently. Mm. For me, I think that my PhD was writing from my wound 
And in many ways, that was um, very, very helpful. But it wasn't a great piece of creative work. I mean, it it won a couple of research medals. Clearly, it was great research. It was really important um, for a lot of people who who thought it was very powerful and meaningful material. But, um, yeah, it it wasn't a creative work. I hadn't developed the craft of writing very very fully at that point so I do look back and wince a little bit at the overwriting and the kind of self-consciousness I haven't done that yet about Ivor Rook so that's good I haven't sort of looked at a bit and gone oh my god yet to this point I'm really happy with it still now that, that that's good now it didn't Ivor Rook wasn't the original name can you talk about what so the original the, name was and why you why it changed? Yeah, sure. Um, it was originally uh, Silk Purse. That was the working title, and I called it that because uh, Silk Purse is obviously a really easy and and mm. and very sort of profound metaphor for female genitalia. And very also, Jungian. I brought well, very Jungian, very Freudian too. Freudian, Freudian, Freudian yeah. Sort of, yeah. Um, so, yeah, probably particularly Freudian because yeah, Freudian, he was quite yeah. reductive in, in his metaphors. Um, but, yeah, then I sort of brought it into, so it was. it's in both narratives. There's a silk purse in both narratives because I was kind of playing around with that and, and with how the two narratives are linked, which they are, but you don't find out till mm. about three quarters of the way, two thirds of the way through the book. Um, but then I think that I got to the point where I just felt it was a bit too explicit. And also I was kind of still working away a little bit on the memoir at the same time. So I thought, look, I'd rather call the memoir Silk Purse or My Silk Purse. Um, and then what happened, I guess so it was all kind of happening simultaneously over a year or so, but... I was also doing a lot of research into um, rugby school at that point because that's where Arthur Rochdale mm, in Ivor yeah. Rook in the Victorian timeline goes to rugby school. So I was doing quite a lot of research about rugby school. I got stuck there for about a year. And um, Of all things so to be really... stuck doing research. <laughs> Do you, are, are you a rugby crazy. fan, Joe? Or... Oh, no, no. The rugby school, it was just such an interesting history. I just And I got stuck in Arthur's childhood just because I loved him so much. So I must, I must really admit, you, paint, you, you drew Arthur really well. I mean, oh, good. I, I, I got a sense of how he's feeling, especially in that, in that I won't give it away for people, but that mm. the, the beginning part when we meet Arthur and what he mm. has to go through, that traumatic event, you, you really sort of painted that really well. But that's a, at a side. Oh, Keep going. thank you. Mm. No, that, thank you. I really, I'm really pleased about that because I wanted it to. It's actually based on my father, uh, the, that story as well, because uh. that's what he experienced. Um, and he, he went to a school, a boarding school in England and um, was born in Rochdale. So, mm. yeah, I mean, a whole stack of, there's a whole stack of ways. It, it, it's, it's dad as well, Arthur is dad, mm. um, as well as other people. As, as characters are. So I was reading Tom Brown's School Days, which is set at rugby school. It was written in maybe 1852 or 1858, something like that, um, by Thomas Hughes, I think. Mm. Uh, but he has he talks about the rook tree outside the headmaster's window and the rooks, you know, the rooks come up here and there about circling. So they I brought them into Arthur's scene uh, story, and particularly that scene where he is in the headmaster's study. Um, and then I found now for so people that who the, don't know, some yeah. people may not know what a rook is. I have to ah. actually Google it myself. It's ah. basically it's from the crow family or from the raven family. Now these are mainly found in the northern hemisphere around Britain, England. So there we go. So that's so that's an American crow. That was from a, a lovely social media friend called Rosalind McFarlane sent me that. She's a great ah. postcard person. Mm. Um, that's an American crow, but yes, that's a rook. So the closest yeah. we would have would be our, our crow. Yeah, um, yeah, and they've got kind of like a shorter beak in a, in a way. And uh, all I can say is I am so sick of – we're surrounded by crows where I live, and all I hear all day long is – I've become really, really fond of crows. I didn't used to like them as much, but I think it's because of the rook I've really developed a kind of um, – yeah. Is it your, so, your yeah, spirit so then, animal? Then, then, um, yeah, somebody did ask me that, and I said, I think it, it, it might be now. But, yeah, then, then the rook just started coming up spontaneously again, and it seemed to be a really good reflection of where Arthur was at. 
Mm. Um, but it was also to do with that idea of the two bodies that Alice explores in the book about the body that we form through with our eyes of sight, which is symmetrical and whole, and the one that's formed through sensation or pain, which is sort of fragmentary. Mm. Um, so the rook and um, the reflection in the eye of a rook is sort of to, to do with that. I, I don't want to talk about it too much because it kind of brings in yeah, yeah, what yeah. happens later, but but it's to do also with creativity and the ways in which creativity can make something whole from something that is fragmented. So the rook is connected to that. Gotcha. Okay. And that yeah. and that's part of your journey to create something whole out of something so fragmented and so horrible to make that into something. Yeah. Yeah. Absolutely. Absolutely. Yeah. yeah. So what's your relationship with your body now? Um, it's, I'm much more aware of it. I have to look after it a lot more. So I do things pretty well every day for it. I have specific exercises that I do for mm. particular muscles. Um, I'm, I'm more, I think I was actually writing about this yesterday. I think as a society we're quite obsessed with our bodies but we're actually not connected to them. We want them to look a particular way and be a particular way. So, yeah, so um, we want to I control them, I can them, totally basically. vouch for that. I can, I, I'm yeah. in my head all the time, but not in my body. And that's, yeah. that's, that's one thing everyone keeps saying, Josh, return to your body. But, but that's, that's uh, one of the baselines of anxiety is you're constantly in your head, ruminating about everything else and whatever, or daydreaming. And you're not here to, to yes. work what this work this thing is. Yeah. Exactly. And it's so important to ground yourself. So I think that I've had to be made aware of my body. I don't take it for granted in any way. Um, I still feel a bit ambivalent about it because it does mm. cause pain and so on. But um, I'm... it's more me than it used to be. I'm more my body than I used to be. That's for sure. Um, I can't separate out different areas. Mm. I think like I used to, like you say about being in your head, mm. I used to be very much in my head and I, I still can be at times, but um, the, my body reminds me that I'm an animal, you know, um, I'm a human, but I, I'm an animal. We're mm. animals. Mm. Um, mm. So, and you know, that's something that we need to, I think, take into account in the ways that we live. I think we try to distance ourselves from that all the time. Um, and then the horrible animalistic things come out through really horrible acts you mm. know, of, of murder and Actually, mayhem. There's, there's a new book out by someone which is about uh, basically about that. I heard an interview on Radio National. I can't remember the lady's name or the book's name, oh. which is pretty useless. But she, the book is about <laughs> getting back, reminding ourselves that we are animals and we are have we do have all these animalistic instincts of, of touch and, and nurture and all these other mm. things which are all body based as opposed Absolutely. to constantly living in our heads which is which is what this society really does to us as opposed exactly. to being present with their bodies doing what our bodies need to do um i think that's really interesting yes. now speaking of that yeah a quick segue we're going to wrap it up shortly but i, I read somewhere that you've got an interest in inter intergenerational trauma Mm. Am I right there? Yeah, yeah, no, I do. I yeah. do. Yes, um, yep. Are you looking at, at writing anything in the future based on that? Because that's one of the things I'm fascinated with as well. Oh, really? Mm. Oh, okay. Uh, yes, yes, I am at the moment. You never know what's going to happen with your writing. But at the moment I'm looking at, uh, yeah, intergenerational trauma, a family that's sort of over a couple of centuries, not necessarily every generation, mm. uh, but maybe four or five of the, the generations during that period, uh, going into the future as well. I'm really interested in the ways in which uh, trauma can um, thread its way through a family um, you know, there's so much, there's mm. so much um, data on that now on, you know, um, the children of Vietnam vets or yep. grandkids of survivors of the Holocaust and so on. Yeah. So, yeah, and I'm, I'm really interested in, I guess, genetics and epigenetics. That's um, the word I was thinking change. of, epigenetics, yes, that's it. Epigenetics. Yeah. Yeah. So, yeah, yeah, genetics being what you inherit, but epigenetics being what happens during your life and how that changes your DNA. Um, so, yeah, I'm very interested in that and I'm really interested in taking it a little bit into the future to sort of play with that idea 
of what might happen in the future. And, and I'm very interested in the creative response to trauma. I think we try to get over trauma. You know, I think that mm. our, our tendency to repeat yes. sort of traumas mm. is a way of us trying to resolve it as well. So I'm really interested in that kind of the ways in which we try to creatively resolve trauma. Mm. I, I, I like the idea of, of being able to notice when trauma is being passed down when and then when someone takes that 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 creative and brave decision to go no i'm the one who's actually noticed the trauma i'm living with it and i would say no it is not going to be passed down it will not continue that trauma stops with me and you and, and do like, you think and that, do you think that, you can do that i think you can i think you can by doing the healing the internal healing i think Maybe I'm going out on a limb here, but if you can do your own internal healing, whichever way, how it happens, through writing, through therapy, through psychedelics, whatever it's going to be, I think that can actually, some strange way, prevent that trauma from continuing on for the epigenetics to keep going for that, for those genes to switch on and off under certain situations. I think you can you can almost heal an entire generation by just being aware of it. Because most people aren't aware and they just blindly keep going. My family did that, yeah. blindly kept going, repeating the same things. And just and it's like me, okay, well, I'm, I'm, I'm going, well, I, do I want to continue this? Do I want to keep mm. feeling like this? No, I don't. I will take responsibility mm. and do that healing. I mean, I'm, I'm, I'm only speculating here, Joe, and I'm thinking it's like it's a great thing to write about as well and to use writing as, as part of that therapy and to let other people I, yeah. know. That they're not. I guess the only problem with that model is that usually, um, and I agree, I agree with you, I do think there's a lot you can do, a lot mm. you can do, um, but the only problem is often that we reproduce so genetically, pass on genetic material often at an age before we've kind of really yeah, good worked point. through. Yeah, good point, good point. <laughs> so, well, luckily, luckily me being gay, I've put a full stop to that. <laughs> Well, that's sure one my... way. But look, you're, you're doing the brave work of doing it for yourself and for your yeah. family around you as well. And I think yeah. that's really, really important work. Yeah, exactly, exactly. Mm -hmm. Look, Josephine, look, congratulations so much on Ivor Rook. I really hope it gets out there and really brings the whole thing of um, Volvodynia out to the in the consciousness and get people talking about it. Let's raise awareness. And I really applaud you for talking about it, writing the book, and doing all that. So thank you so much for taking the time to talk to me, Joe. Thank you so much, Josh. I, I really, really loved it. I love that in-depth interview. It's beautiful. Thank you. Thank you so much. Wow.